We'll see if we can make it more laminar by trying to make the hole down a lot lower where there's a lot more pressure. And if this doesn't work, we can make it bigger. But let's, oh, lordy, lordy. I just have some notes. This is nothing like remarkably uh, in depth. We're not gonna sit there and like talk heavily about all of the different things with the uh, turbulent, with all of these different equations, but we wanna outline two major ways to talk about laminar versus turbulent. <clears throat> we'll start with the easier one, which is the Reynolds number. And they kind of exist in the same sense, almost. Um, Reynolds number is a, some might be able to say that Reynolds number is like a, you know, a classification of Navier-Stokes or like a, uh, what's it called? Um, like a special case or something like that. But Reynolds number is basically the following equation and it's going to be UL over nu, uh, where U is the flow speed or the velocity of the water, or of the fluid, I should say, um, not necessarily water. L is the characteristic dimension, so it depends on the circumstance, right? So if it's like a circular thing, which is pretty much all what we're going to be able to, or all that we're doing, so let's label this, this is gonna be flow speed. This is going to be, uh, uh, let's say characteristic, dimension. So like for instance, if we want to talk about, what was that? Did I just write dimension? Um, <clears throat> dimension. So if you want to talk about like a pipe, you might talk about the cross section of a pipe is what we're talking about with characteristic dimension. It completely depends on the shape of the object, right? So it, this is going to change based on shape to shape or object to object. And this is called the kinematic, kinematic viscosity. And the kinematic viscosity can be rewritten in a different sense of the dynamic velocity. Dynamic velocity. I think in our Navier-Stokes, we'll talk more about the, uh, let's do kinematic velocity, or I'm sorry, the dynamic velocity over the density of the fluid. And I think we'll do, uh, we'll talk more about the dynamic velocity, or viscosity, excuse me, viscosity? dynamic viscosity and this is the density and we're gonna see a couple different a uh, couple different things so Newtonian fluids yeah so mainly Newtonian fluids for this the um the big thing about this with uh the big thing about the where where the Newtonian fluids will matter is all in the viscosity formulas uh, the Reynolds number is a ratio of inertial forces versus viscous forces. So like inertial versus forces versus viscous forces. And the viscosity is really what we're going to talk about when we talk about the, um, the Newtonian fluids versus non-Newtonian fluids. We want the, very specifically, we want the viscosity to be able to describe like a motion, right? That's the whole thing. And that's where Navier-Stokes really comes through for us, even though it's like far more complicated to understand is the uh is the motion of the fluid in three dimensions and that's why this is a millennium problem is because we don't know what kind of the solutions really exist in three dimensions for the navier stokes problems um but let's finish talking about the reynolds number first the reynolds number uh has uh two things that we're really interested in if it's a low reynolds number then this is normally associated with a laminar flow and a high uh, a high Reynolds number is associated usually with turbulence. Navier Stokes talks about emotion. Count me in. What? <laughs> talks about emotion. <laughs> Not exactly emotion. <laughs> okay, so let's keep going. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so this is basically the Reynolds number. We can see if it's something is, hi is higher in viscosity. What does that mean? If it's higher in viscosity, that means that this overall number is going to be lower, so it's going to be more laminar flow. Okay, so let's talk about, yeah, so if we see a high viscosity, that means this number is going to be lower, and that we see that it's going to be more of a laminar flow. Same thing with flow speed. If flow speed is lower, 
we're looking more for a, uh, a laminar flow. And the characters to mention will change the outcome as well. So, nothing better than some Sunday physics. Yes, I know. So this, this, this is just, we're just going to explore the next one. <laughs> I, I say this because I don't want people to get intimidated. This one's a kind of a big one. All right. So we're going to write it out so that people who are interested in the math can see it. But again, don't be intimidated by it. I will explain the pieces of it, and then the pieces are really all you need to know. So for Navier-Stokes, it's a much more, uh, more all-inclusive thing, but there's less solutions of it. Okay? And it's all-inclusive because it, it, it tells us about the turbulent flow. It tells us about laminar flow, although it's still not totally proven that laminar flow and turbulent, turbulent flow, flow are going to be solutions of Navier-Stokes, because that would mean you'd have to have all of the solutions of Navier-Stokes, which we don't have. Um, but it does tell you more about the motion of the fluid in three dimensions. So let's see here. Let me write it all out. We have the density times the partial of the flow speed with respect to time plus the flow speed dotted with the gradient of the flow speed. And that's going to be equal to the gradient of the um, pressure. I might have to double check that. I think there might be a mistake there. I think that's either squared or something. Maybe that's squared. I have to double check that. I might have missed a square. Uh, I should probably hop down to the next row, though, huh? Um, and then, plus added to that, we have the gradient of mu, which is our dynamical viscosity. <laughs> um, the gradient of u plus the gradient of u transpose minus two-thirds the uh, dynamical viscosity gradient of u. I'm writing it all out, like I said. I actually don't know what i is. I forgot to look that one up. Uh, plus f. Now, let's kind of break these down and talk about what they are. So this one specifically, we'll call it 1. Um, and then we have this term, we'll call it 2. This term right here, up to here, we'll call 3. And then this one we'll call 4. And I can link the website to this afterwards if you guys remind me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, if you guys link this, I can, or if you guys remind me in Discord, I'll link my reference for this. Uh, okay, so let's break these down into the different pieces and sort of explain what they are. The first one is just the inertial forces. So this is the, uh, in the, uh, let me finish writing it. Ah, there we are. So the inertial forces are the top of the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number, again, is a ratio of inertial forces versus viscosity forces. And that's why it's more of a special case where we don't really necessarily need to worry about the other things like two. Two is the pressure forces. Pressure forces. So imagine that there's some, you know, again, maybe some pressures on the sides of the object where uh, it's not necessarily as straightforward, like atmospheric pressure or things like that, right? We, there's more things to consider and also a lot more factors, and that's why it shows up in uh, the Navier-Stokes, but not necessarily in the Reynolds number. Again, this, this uh, inertial forces at the top is very inclusive. It has a lot of things involved in it. There might be some ways to tie in pressure forces as long as they're small or something to this, uh, but nevertheless, Three is the viscosity forces. <clears throat> and we say, very simply, in the Reynolds number, that that all exists right here. Uh, but as you see, viscosity is complicated, right? It exists right here. That's what we call the viscosity forces. Now, this is where we talk really about viscosity. Like, for instance, if you have sheets, if you want to split the material into sheets, um, there's going to be a lot of different things happening here. And this is, we talked a lot about this when we did non-Newtonian fluids a long time ago. Boring math professor, good to see you. Thank you for the shout out, Tyrion. Um, <laughs> I came to watch you blow something up. We'll get to it, I'm telling you. I'm going to turn back time, okay? If I could turn back time, okay? If I could find a way, but not really. Okay, so... <clears throat> The viscosity, like if the material, if the fluid or the liquid or whatever it is, is, you know, highly viscous, you can imagine all the different forces on this. So there's going to be 
interactions going this way, there's going to be interactions going this way, and there's going to be interactions going this way. So <clears throat> in three dimensions, right? So you can imagine to have like, let's see here. We'll use these. <clears throat> so you can imagine you have sheets, right? And as these sheets, let me go, maybe, let me go closer. <laughs> let me go closer and refocus. <clears throat> So you can imagine you have these sheets in the, in the liquid, OK? And it's just the amount of objects that are all, wait, what? Focus, you. There you go. Um, so imagine you have all these sheets, and it's like this is the material, right? There's going to be a lot of friction forces this way. And you can imagine that if these were like smaller and more fluid-like, then you would have forces going the other way. Like they'd be running, brushing up against this way or uh, this way. So you can have different forces acting in different ways. But for the one dimensional case, you can just imagine that they're all just shifting like this. Okay? Um, but you can imagine that like <clears throat> something with non-Newtonian fluids where this is going to be different, right? We studied the, the cornstarch. What happened with cornstarch? Well, if you press on it in a certain direction, these don't want to slide anymore. Right? They want to instead just break. That's why when cornstarch, when you press it or squeeze it, then it crumbles. It's crumbly. It has like a weird solid mixture. Right? But then when you don't press it, these become relaxed and they start flowing again naturally. Right? So that's, that's the cool thing about Navier-Stokes is because all of the viscosity stuff that takes care of whether or not something behaves Newtonian like water or non-Newtonian like cornstarch and water really exists in this viscosity term. And in, well, in the whole of the Navier-Stokes. But that's why it's the way it is, right? And then four is the force of the external forces. So for our instances today, we're just going to do gravity. External <coughs> forces. A non-Newtonian fluid. Yeah, so that's, that's like, uh, what's the, yeah, so cornstarch and water is non-Newtonian. Toothpaste is non-Newtonian. Uh, ketchup is non-Newtonian. Ketchup and toothpaste are the opposite. Uh, the opposite, oh, the metric would be, um, so that's, okay, so the metric exists elsewhere. There's, a, there's another way, uh, there's another relationship that I didn't write on the board. I could write it on the board if you want to see it, for sure. Let me see here. <clears throat> so this is the conservation of momentum term. Where did I put my notebook? There's another thing that's a conservation of maths, of mass. Um, can I write it somewhere small? Yeah, I can write it somewhere small. Um, I don't want to erase any of this. I want to go back to it later, I think. Let's see. Let me see if I can rewrite it right here. So this is conservation of momentum, and the conservation of mass is much smaller. It's just d rho dt plus the gradient of or the divergence of rho u is equal to zero. And this is the conservation of momentum. This is the conservation of, moment, of mass. And of, uh, fluids have to obey these two things. And the solutions to Navier-Stokes has to exist in both of these. Right. Um, and then the, there's a, there is a metric or like a, I don't know about a metric or a tensor. Probably tensor is a better word. Well, then it describes this stuff more cleanly, but I don't have it written down right now. We can just go find it. Shear thickening versus shear thinning. Very good. So toothpaste and ketchup work the opposite. There, if you put pressure on here, instead of like locking up the plates so that you can't move them, instead of you put pressure, it actually makes them slide faster. Um, it's like if you press down on it, it becomes a slip and slide. Versus if you press down on it, it becomes sandpaper. So that's the difference. Very cool stuff. Uh, and again, we, we did that a while back. It was pretty fun. I was hitting oobleck with a hammer to see what would happen to it, and it was like just absorbing the blows. My attitude is not Newtonian. I have no idea if that's a good thing or not. But let's do some experiments and kind of like see this. The first one I want to do is a simple demonstration. This doesn't require any building. This just requires us to look at the difference between turbulent flow and laminar flow. And we're going to do it by changing a couple of these variables in the Reynolds number. Okay? And one of those is going to be uh, <clears throat> velocity as a form of pressure. So we're going to change the pressure. OK, so let's start with a little and see if we get some laminar flow from here. And then we'll actually like take a look and see the difference between the two and whatnot, too.
But no, so this is not very good. You don't, you see the fluid's not really coming out well. It's very, we, call, we do call this turbulent because it's just not, nothing's happening. Like, let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger by just sort of working it around. And yeah, I mean the way that it's pouring out of the cup, if you look really closely, so it's just sort of falling out of the cup. You can see little fluctuations in the wave where it's not like a continuous, like nice flow. It's just not very good. So then what we'll do is we'll see if we can make it more laminar. Hold on. We'll see if we can make it more laminar by trying to make the hole down a lot lower where there's a lot more pressure. And if this doesn't work, we can make it bigger. But let's, oh, lotty, lotty. But yeah, this is a lot better. So you can see here, we're getting some decent stream right here. So now we see a lot of laminar flow going on here. You can see how it's nice and clean coming out. But then it gets to a certain spot where you get to kind of turbulent, right? And then the cool thing about this, as water goes everywhere, the cool thing about this, we're going to show it again. <clears throat> <laughs> I thought it would go into the cup more, <laughs> but it really didn't go into the cup for very much at all. Um, ooh. All right, so we're going to stop doing the zoom in stuff. Let's, let me plug the top or the bottom hole, and we'll fill it up with oil and see if we can't see a, uh, a difference. And then in the top versus the bottom. And then what we'll do is we'll kind of like try to measure a little bit here of the, uh, of the difference between the viscosity of water versus viscosity of oil. Now again, remember, if it's a higher viscosity, it's going to be a lower Reynolds number and the flow is going to be more laminar. But the problem with that is like higher velocity uh, of flow <coughs> or higher viscosity usually means a slower flow speed. So let's see here. Move this over a little bit. So let's see the bottom hole. It's not even coming through the top hole at all. But let's see the bottom hole and see if we can see some more, uh, if we see another laminar flow or if it's more turbulent, which would mean the viscosity is less. So the water speed's definitely less. But notice, if we go down to look at the bottom of the stream, the turbulent flow it doesn't happen there. So I would say this is more laminar. You can see, you can see it's a lot more laminar, actually. Ooh, look at that. But the speed is definitely significantly lower. So I would say oil is much more viscous. So yeah, you can see how nice and laminar that flow is. A lot of that has to do with the way that those sheets of molecules are interacting. But this is kind of cool because you can definitely see the difference between the laminar and the, uh, and the, <clears throat> the non-laminar. But now let's go to the next one. The next one's just going to be, I'm just going to pour the next one because... I'm just going to put this off to the side for right now. I'm just going to pour the next one because the next one won't come out of the holes because it's highly viscous. And instead, actually, let's rearrange the camera just a hair. There we go. So this one we're just going to pour into the hair. And you're just going to be able to see it's really going to have like major large sheets of viscosity. And that's because the corn syrup, we're doing the corn syrup now, is a highly viscous. So now when I pour it out of this shaped container, we can see like nice sheets really formed. Do you see how the sheets, see what it looks like, how it's a thin, it's like nice and thin and spread out. And that's an, in, that's an indication of the way the molecules are formed and how they move, right? And all of that can be explained well using Navier-Stokes. 